Well, our scripture we're going to be studying this morning is from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 16 this morning. Um, let us read to you the, the very opening statements from Warren Wiersbe's book, I think, are really good. He says, For the third time we are considering the subject of love. This does not mean that John ran out of ideas and had to repeat himself. It means that the Holy Spirit, who inspired John, presents the subject once more from a deeper point of view. First, love for the brethren has been shown as a proof of fellowship with God. We read about this in 1 John 2, 7-11. through 11. Then, it has been presented as proof of sonship. And we read about that in chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. In the earlier passage, love for the brethren is a matter of light or darkness. In the second, it is a matter of life or death. But in John, 1 John 4, 7 through 16, we get down to the very foundation of the matter. Here we discover why love is such an important part of life that is real. Love, now let, don't miss this. Love is a valid test of our fellowship and our sonship because God is love. Love is part of the very being and nature of God. If we are united to God through faith in Christ, we share His nature. And since His nature is love, love is the test of the reality of our spiritual life. John says it. You don't love, you don't have God. And we know that love is a very important part of uh, the fellowship. Um, we are to love one another. We will find out that that is uh, proof of our relationship with God, and that is God's love being made complete. I know that sounds like an amazing thing, but our love for one another is a completion or a fulfillment of God's love. Now, how can fallen beings like you and I who, who struggle with envy and hate and jealousy and, and all of that, how can God's love be perfected in us, loving one another? Well, let's study that and we'll find out. John says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning propitiation, sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God is in us and His love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in Him and He in us. He has given us, He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be a Savior in the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. So there's three words in our passage that are very repetitive. Love is one of them. Live or abide is another one. And then the uh, last one, let's see, love, is no, know, K-N-O-W. Remember, John is dealing with an early form of Gnosticism. The Gnostics say that you have to have special knowledge in order to be saved, and, and they are the keepers of the special knowledge, just like the cults of today. All right, nothing's changed. The names have just changed. That's, that's all. But the love that uh, John is talking about is the word agape. 
Okay, agape is a very special kind of love. It represents God's pure love. We are not truly capable of expressing agape love until the Holy Spirit dwells within us. I think the best we can muster is uh, phileo, where our term Philadelphia comes from, brotherly love. But agape love is very unique and very special. Now, we can, we can, uh, we can understand eros. Um, as husbands and wives, we, we, have, we have that relationship, and there is that kind of love. But this is agape love. It doesn't think twice about being sacrificial. Okay? It places no condition on the recipients. Certainly that is rare among people, even us. Our love is almost always conditional. And what I mean by that is, I'll love you, but what am I going to get in return? I'll love you, but how will that affect me? I'll love you, but will you love me back? God's love is not like that. And, and it says that not that we love God, in verse 10, but that He loved us. Not that we loved Him, but that He loved us. He loved us so much that He sent His one and only begotten, very special, unique Son to be the atoning sacrifice of our sins. Now the Holy Spirit, as I said, makes it possible for us to demonstrate that agape love. Uh, and that agape love is the truth or the evidence that you have been born again, that you are a child of God. No love, no God. No agape love, no God. Are you loving unconditionally? Are you loving sacrificially? That is evidence that you know God. People that don't love sacrificially or don't love unconditionally don't know God because that's the kind of love that John is talking about. So God has sent His Son into the world for six very special reasons. And I'm stealing this from Pastor Paul Laboutier, who is the Calvary, uh, Ontario, Calvary, Ontario, Oregon, Calvary Church minister. He says, first of all, God has sent His Son into the world so that it might be revealed who truly knows Him. God sent Jesus into the world so it would be revealed who truly knows God. Okay, without Jesus coming into the world, we wouldn't know. Think about, think about the Spirit of God and how He has existed among people throughout the Bible. When, when He was with Adam and Eve, how did He exist with them? How did the Bible describe it? Anybody remember? God walked with them. Okay, He walked with them. Okay. When he was in the, with the Israelites in the desert, he dwelt with them. He lived among them. When he came into Solomon's temple, he was again dwelling among them. And then the prophet Ezekiel saw the Spirit of God, the Shekinah glory of God, leave the temple. Did it ever return? Yes. It manifested itself again kind of glory of God in the person of Christ Jesus. And He is the manifestation of the Shekinah glory of God. And those who know Jesus know the Father. Okay, Jesus says that Himself. If you know Me, you know the Father. If you know the Father, you know Me. Because I am in the Father and He is in Me. Second reason that God sent His Son into the world so that He might show His love among us and that we would know it. How would we know love, agape love, if Jesus had not come into the world? Did Jesus come as the King of kings, Lord of lords? He did. But did He live that way? No. He lived as a servant, a poor servant, a poor carpenter. And when he started his mission, when he started his ministry, it was all about serving the needs of other people and ultimately providing a solution 
for our sin problem. Okay? And that was always Jesus' mission. Okay? There are the cults that say that Jesus was just a common man, and upon his baptism, the Spirit of Jesus entered his body, and just before he was crucified, it left his body and went into heaven, and, and it was just Jesus, the man that was crucified. That's hogwash. Okay? This was the God man from the time he was born to the time he ascended into heaven after his resurrection. Number three, God sent his Son into the world so that we might live through him. Now, this one re really interests me. When we think about living through him, I don't know about you, but I think about heaven. I think about the ability to live eternally. But is it limited to that? It's not limited to eternity only. It is for today. It is for today. We are to be Christ-like in our deeds and our words. We are to live like He lived. Does that mean you have to be poor? No. It doesn't mean you have to be poor, but it means you have to be generous with your abundance that God has given to you, that you have to be a good steward of what God has given you. And being a good steward doesn't mean buying everything that you need. A good steward is meeting the needs of everyone around you. Okay, if you're a father or a mother, okay, being a good steward of your blessings from God certainly <laughs> extends to you caring for your children and providing for their needs. Not just materialistically, but emotionally, spiritually, mentally. All of those things. We have to care for our kids. And I'm telling you right now, being part of the public school system, it is clearly evident to me that that is not happening in most homes. Here's a, here's a, here's a scary statistic. 70% of our kids in school come from a non-traditional home. What's non-traditional? Husband and wife and kids is traditional. Everything else is none. Think about all the grandparents you know that are raising their grandchildren. Think of all the single moms. Think of all the single dads. Think of all the mixed families. Okay, those are all non-traditional homes. And that is not God's plan. All right? One man, one woman providing, raising them up to, to know God, to have knowledge of the Lord. Okay? You have, if you raise your children to fear God, and I mean reverent fear, if you raise your children up to fear God, everything else will take care of itself. You realize that? If you raise them up to know God, to love God, to be reverent to God, everything else will take care of itself. It's amazing God has given us everything we need. He has given us a guide for everything we need in, in the Bible. Number four, God sent His Son into the world as an atoning sacrifice, or that word propitiation, which we've talked about before, for our sins. Okay? Um, I've got some examples from Scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. There's that live, to abide, to abide. How many of you have a, a soulmate? Yeah? Maybe it's not your spouse, maybe it's a friend. But, but a soulmate, a kindred spirit, <laughs> let's say. Okay? That's kind of the idea of abide. Right? If you have that special, intimate relationship emotionally, that's how we are to exist with Christ. That's how we are to exist with who, the person that should be our best friend that is dwelling in us. I'm reading a book right now. I just started it last night. Uh, the, God who, the God I Never Knew. And it's about the Holy Spirit. And just in the first and second chapter, I'm going, oh my goodness. I have missed out on so much. 
I can't wait to finish the rest of the book. We, we have God dwelling in us. And for some reason, in the church, the Holy Spirit has been treated like Cousin Eddie. Or that, that crazy uncle that nobody wants to deal with at the family reunions. Okay, yeah, he's part of the family, but let's not talk about him. Okay? The, the Holy Spirit has been like the boogeyman to church. And that is not. How does Jesus describe the Holy Spirit? The comforter, the counselor, the helper. Who doesn't want a helper? My gosh, folks, this, this life is so hard. Why, why do you want to navigate it on your own when you have the source of creation dwelling in you? You have the source of eternity dwelling in you. You have the source of all life dwelling in you. Why not live your life reliant on someone who knows what they're doing? Because we certainly don't, right? <laughs> we're, we're just trying to follow the instructions, and, and quite frankly, we're not very good at it. Okay, And we need somebody to help us. I got off the tangent a little bit there. God sent His Son into the world as a reminder that we need to love one another in that same way. What same way is that? Sacrificially. Unconditionally. That's how we are to love one another, church. And then lastly, God sent His Son into the world so that God's love might be completed in us perfected, fulfilled. His love is what we are able to show if we choose to do it. See, a lot of people say, well, you know, love is this, love is that. Okay. I love popcorn. Is that the same kind of love that I'm supposed to demonstrate the way I love popcorn? Okay, I, I love our dog. Okay, she's a real sweetheart. Is that how I'm supposed to love other people? No. You see, God is love, but love is not God. I want you to understand that. God defines love. We do not. All of us have our own definition of love. And all of us are wrong. God's love is the definition of love. John has told us that in my study Bible, it says that, that verse 12, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and, and His love is made complete in us. Um, actually, sorry, 4.8, no one knows God. Uh, whoever does not love does not know God because He is love. This is what my study Bible says. God is love in his essential nature, and in all his actions. God is loving. John similarly affirms that God is spirit and light, love, as well as holy, powerful, faithful, true, and just. He is perfect in all those attributes. So yes, he's a loving God, but he's also a just God. Okay? He's light, but He's also just. Okay, He's spirit. And no one has ever seen God because humanity or a human being cannot look at God in His actual uh, presence as He is, or we would die. But look at, you say, well, wait a minute. God appeared to Abraham, and He appeared to Adam and Eve, and all these people God appeared to. Yeah, but he took on a different form. Okay? Even when Moses went up to Mount Sinai, God only allowed Moses to see his backside and shield his, shielded his full glory so Moses wouldn't perish. Okay? And, and we need to understand that that's not a complicated verse as a lot of people um, make it out to be. But this, this last part of our Scripture... I think is what I want to focus on the most because it talks about our relationship with one another. 
And we are, we are in this together. Okay, we are in this together. And, and we always need to keep that in mind. Okay, we, we are not meant to navigate Christianity by ourselves. First of all, we have a helper. We talked about that. Secondly, we have fellowship with one another. And that's why it's so important that God says that we love one another. That Jesus says we love one another so that people will know that you are my disciples. Okay? First of all, He's given us His Spirit. Then we have different testimonies that John talks about. Okay, that word testify. Okay, we can testify that God has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. That should be part of our testimony. God sent His Son to save me, and this is how He did it. But God loved me enough to send Jesus to die for me. That should be part of our testimony. And then another part of our testimony should be, if you acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, which means He is God in the flesh, the Son of God just doesn't mean that He's His, his Son. Okay? He wasn't born of God. He wasn't created by God. He has always existed with God. Okay? Yes, He was born as a human being. That's how He came into the world. But, but Christ, Jesus Christ, was never born of God. He's always existed. So if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is God, is deity, God lives in them. Holy Spirit, helper. Okay? If you want to confess that Christ is the Son of God, okay, that is part of the salvation process. People go, process? Oh, don't say that. Well, I don't know what else to call it. Okay, there, there, there are certain things that God requires. And the first one is to recognize that Jesus is God. To confess Him as Savior. To confess Him then as Lord. To be willing to follow Him, which means repent of our sins. To be obedient to Him, which means to be immersed as He was immersed. Those are all important things. Okay, I, They're not my things, they're the Bible's things. They're God's things. So if anyone acknowledges Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. How do we live in God? You ever heard that song? I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. I don't know who wrote that. I'm guessing it was one of the Gaithers, but I don't know. But anyways... That, that's what it is. To be born of God and to be in God is to be part of His family. Okay, to be a joint heir with Christ. To be my brother. To be me to be your sister. To be your brother. That's what it means. Okay, we're part of the family. And so we know. John's going, you Gnostics don't know anything. We know. So we know, we apostles know. Listen to us. Remember we just talked about John saying, go back to the beginning when you got our instruction from us. He's, he's written this letter so that they can know they have salvation. So that we can know we have salvation. That's the whole purpose of this letter is to combat false teaching. And that's what we've got to do today. <laughs> you want to talk about heresies. There is so much false teaching in the church. In the church. I'm trying to decide whether to point out some or not, but maybe I better not. You all know the errors. Okay? The, the church isn't a greater authority than God or Scripture. Scripture is the authority. Okay, we're, we're human beings. This was, this was Holy Spirit inspired. Okay, I, I don't care how white your 
gown is, you don't have the authority of Scripture. That's one of my problems with the church. Another problem I have with the church is tradition. Tradition gets in the way of worship. It just does. Okay? And, I, and I'm speaking to a very traditionally valued church here. I'm not saying that tradition isn't important. I'm just saying that tradition can restrain you from worship. Well, that's how our parents did it. Yeah, I know. Do you feel closer to God than, than they did? Because all of us, as we grow and mature, as we, as we follow in the, in the way, the, the road that was paved for us by the saints, okay, we should always build upon that. Not be content with the relationship our mom and dad had, or whoever invested in us, but to mature further than that so that the next person can be nearer to God and grow in that. Okay, our, our worship shouldn't be limited to just what we know in the past. Our worship should mature as we mature. And worship is not limited to Sunday morning and four songs. Worship is how you live. Worship is how you live every day, every waking hour. It's how you live. Are you, are you seeing the world through the eyes of Christ? Or are you seeing the world through your own eyes? Remember I talk about eternal spectacles all the time? Eternity glasses? Okay? We need to put on the vision of Christ and see the world as He saw it. How did He see it? The harvest, the, the fields were ripe. Okay? The fields are ripe now. Are you telling me that this world doesn't need Jesus any more than it needed Him a century ago? Man, this world is desperate for Jesus. Did you see the news clippings of some of the servicemen in Afghanistan up on a wall and Afghan mothers handing U.S. soldiers their babies? That's the world that Jesus sees. Okay, We live in the Midwest. It's a great place to live. Okay, Wendy and I drove around in the golf cart last night and, and just... You know, we say, "Oh, this is beautiful. Oh, this needs tore down." And you know, you know, you guys do it too. Okay, we drove by all the campers, and but but we just enjoyed the peace of the evening until Claire called and said, "This baby won't quit crying." <laughs> she probably wouldn't like that. Okay, but anyways, look, we are sheltered, is what I'm trying to say here in little old Putnam County. But all you gotta do. And I'm not bad mouthing any people. I'm not bad mouthing any place. All you gotta do is get in your car, take a drive around town, go sit in Casey's parking lot, go sit in High V parking lot, and you will soon realize this world needs Jesus bad. Right here in Putnam County. Not that we have it all together, not that we have all the love, but that God has love and He is love and His love will be made complete through us. Now do you get it? Yeah. His love will be made complete through our actions. When we show agape love to someone in need unconditionally, then we're showing God's love. And that's how the world will see it. We can talk to people all day about God's love. Proof's in the pudding, right? We have to show it. We have to demonstrate it in our lives. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to be here this morning and to share from your word. Father, to mature in our faith. I pray, Father, for each one of these saints that are here this evening or this afternoon, this morning. I don't even know what time of the day it is, Lord. I pray for them that 
they would be bold and be empowered, strengthened, and overflowing in your love as they demonstrate it to their neighbor, to their family member, to their enemy. Lord, we have to quit picking and choosing who's worthy and who isn't. We're all, we're all guilty of that. The truth of the matter is, is that I'm not worthy. We're, we're all not worthy. And we need to quit placing conditions on those that we think are and those that aren't. It reminds me of the testimony that Chloe shared with me a couple of days, Father, about the young man at Rockhurst that joined her group in the marketing class and said, can, can I be part of this group? And they all said yes. And Chloe sized this guy up. He was kind of a partier and, and uh, thought he was all that and on and on and on. Chloe had him all sized up. And pretty soon she noticed a ring on his ring finger. She said, my goodness, are you married? And she, he said, no, this is my chastity ring. I'm, I'm saving myself for my future wife. How many kids in college, Lord, are we going to encounter like that? Or will Chloe encounter like that? To me, that just blew me away, and it blew Chloe away. Because we can't judge people by appearance or attitude or, or what they say. It's what's in their heart. And, and in order to understand their heart, we have to get to know them. So, so God, open those doors and give us courage. Give us the words. We know that you will because you dwell in us. You speak to us all the time. Don't do that. Don't say that. It's improper. And sometimes we blurt it out anyways, but sometimes we listen. And you're always right. And so we thank you for your presence, Father. I ask, Lord, that you would guide us now as we go into this time of communion, that we would set our minds and our hearts right, that we would focus on the cross, which made all of this possible. No one, not very many people, want to be remembered for their death or how they died. But Jesus did. He wants it to be imprinted on our minds how He became sin for us and accepted your wrath so that we could be excused and redeemed. We love you, Father, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.